Good morning and welcome to chapel. It's a great day to be gathered together. I, I see a few guests with us. Brother Josh Webster and his family are here all the way from Western Kentucky, so give them a Clear Creek welcome this morning. I said this in faculty staff meeting yesterday, and I wasn't necessarily talking about our waistlines, but we look a little thin in here today, but uh, so glad that you are here. Uh, it's abnormal for me to open chapel, so you can assume that while the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 10, 19, that we are to love the stranger. <laughs> today's preacher is no stranger to Clear Creek. <laughs> yeah. I knew you guys would get a kick out of that. I I also almost didn't do it because I knew you'd take it too far, but that, that's okay. <laughs> Dr. Smith is our professor of expository preaching. He also serves as director of Christian service and as the senior pastor of East Barberville Baptist Church. He's been a dear friend of mine for uh, many, many years, and it's always exciting to hear him open up God's Word and feed us with it. So, Dr. Smith, thank you for being willing to preach today. Uh, excited about the worship team leading us in worship. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we open up our service. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being gathered. And Father, our hearts are heavy uh, for our friends in Israel. Father, we, we pray for them. We pray for what they're going through. Father, we, we pray that your protection, your provision would be about them. And Lord, we capitulate to what you tell us in the scripture. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And Father, we ask you that you would move in this situation like only you can. And Lord, through this, we ask you that uh, numerous individuals would come to faith in you. And Father, we pray this day as we worship you in spirit and in truth in, in this chapel service that you be glorified. We ask you that we might be edified. And, Lord, that our desire to serve you would be multiplied. We pray all these things humbly in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. Isn't it wonderful to be able to come in here into this place and worship the Lord on this day? Stand as we sing this morning a classic hymn that probably means so much to many of us. Come, Thou Fount. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by Seal it for 
thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that thou art, thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my how both of those songs, as you look at them together, can form a sort of prayer that we can offer before the Lord, to pray for the Lord's blessings and to pray for him to be our guiding vision to lead us where we need to go, because he truly knows what we need in every moment. And as we enter into our time of prayer, I invite you sitting or standing or coming to the altar this morning, there is much for us to be in prayer for, especially over in the promised land. And we have much to praise the Lord for also this morning. So let us approach his throne now in this time. Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be able to be gathered in this place this morning. And Lord, there is so much on our hearts today, Lord, in the tragedies that are occurring over in your land, Israel, this morning. And God, we ask that, Lord, you'd be with all those who are going through situations and that, God, in the midst of all that is going on, that, Lord, your light would shine. And that, Lord, this would be a great opportunity for millions of Jews and Muslims to be able to experience you and come to a saving faith in you.
And God, we praise you and we thank you this morning for the work that you are doing even now. We're so thankful that Brother Allen has been able to make it his way home. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the honor and the praise and the glory for it. Lord, be with all the requests that are heavy on our hearts today. And Lord, let us honor and glorify you above all. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running And mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of Reconcile the laws to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. The morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel and shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings, praise for Ever to the King of Kings. Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise this morning. And dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to worship you in song this morning. 
Lord, I ask that, Lord, you would please continue to be with us as we worship through your word now. Lord, please be with Dr. Smith as he comes forward and brings a message that you've laid upon his heart this morning. Lord, hide him behind your cross. Allow it to be only you who is heard today. And God, help us to learn from you this morning and to be attentive to all that you have to say. It's in your son Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. It's always an honor to be able to open the word of the Lord and to be able to serve as his messenger in a moment uh, like this. I am forever grateful for Clear Creek Baptist Bible College and for the blessing that the Lord has given me, not only to be a graduate of this institution, but now to be able to be back as a part of the faculty and uh, the staff. I want to invite you to take uh, your Bible, open with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to look here in the beginning of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to just focus our attention here for a few moments today on verse uh, 3 and uh, verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4. And Peter writes and says, Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we love you, and Lord, we thank you for the privilege to worship your name, and now for the opportunity you've given us, Lord, to open your word and to feast from its truths today. I pray, Lord, as a feeble man for strength, Lord, to stand behind the sacred desk. I pray that every evil and demonic spirit of hell would be bound, and that your Holy Spirit would be free to move and to work in this place today. May you give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your word, Father, and may it encourage us and challenge us, even convict us. Here today, we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I love the story about the little boy. His family uh, made it a habit of inviting the preacher and the preacher's family over to have a Sunday afternoon uh, dinner or lunch, if you will. And so, you know, the, pre the boy was a little bit obnoxious. And uh, every time the preacher would sit down, the boy would catch his mama's back turned. And after she'd set a fresh uh, pan of biscuits there on the stove, homemade biscuits, and that little boy catches catch his mama's back turned, he'd lick the palm of his hand. He'd touch the top of every biscuit, and he'd say, mine, 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 mine. My. I mean, he did it every time. And finally, the preacher thought to himself, he thought, I'm going to teach this boy a lesson. And so the preacher beat the boy to it. He sat down, and that fresh pan of biscuits was there. This time the preacher licked his hand. He touched the top of every biscuit. Mine, 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 mine. And that little boy gave him a mischievous smile, licked the palm of his hand one last time, and went, yours, 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 yours. <laughs> When we open to 1 Peter chapter 1, it's evident here, especially in verse 3 and verse 4, that Peter has heaven on his mind. And I'm thankful this morning that when we look into the pages of Scripture, there's enough of heaven to go around for all of us. Amen? In the words of that little boy, heaven is mine, 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 mine. And if you're saved, the heaven is yours, yours. Yours, But did you notice that Peter is careful in verse 3 to point out the path that leads to heaven? For example, in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy. The path to heaven begins with the mercy of God. And we understand what mercy is, don't we? Kyle Stackowitz, one of our newest staff members, he's a pretty big old boy. And if I were to walk back there and just sock him in the jaw with my right hand, the natural response or reaction would be for him to sock me back. But if he chose to withhold his wrath from me in that moment, that's mercy. Well, because of sin, we deserve the wrath of God. Amen? But thanks to God's mercy, God has withheld his wrath, and instead, God has given us access 
to the place called uh, heaven. And so God's mercy, receiving God's mercy is a part of that path that leads to heaven. We also notice that Peter in verse 3, he, he mentions the new birth. And that reminds me of what Jesus said to Nicodemus in the gospel of John chapter 3. Unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so we've got to experience regeneration. The Holy Spirit of the living God must convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment and bring us to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order for heaven to be mine, 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 or yours, yours, yours. And then there's believing in the resurrection. Did you see that at the end of verse 3? Into a living hope. Anybody thankful today? We serve a living God. Oh, he's not dead. I've stood in the tomb like many who are here in this room. And I think about the garden tomb, and I think about the placard that's above the door when you walk out. He is not here, for he is risen. Well, he's begotten us into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 11 and verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And Jesus asked an important question that day. Do you believe this? In Romans chapter 10, the Bible says, if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, and if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. And if we are saved, then we have the hope of a heavenly inheritance. I ran into a cousin of mine, an extended cousin, up in Lexington a few weeks ago. Hadn't seen him in some time. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm pretty sure he was inebriated, but I like what he said. He said, I've been meaning to reach out to you because I want to include you in my will. <laughs> well, I don't know how much of an inheritance he'll have, but I've got a heavenly inheritance that compares greater beyond anything in earthly nature. Thanks to Jesus, the hope of heaven is living in the heart of every born-again child of God. But that begs the question, what will heaven be like? I get asked that a lot as a pastor. I'm sure that many of the other pastors in this room, that's probably one of the top three or top five questions that we get asked on a regular basis, consistent. But, Pastor, what, what will heaven be like? Well, let's look closely at verse 4. And I think in verse 4 we we see Peter giving us a glimpse into what we can expect from our heavenly inheritance. There's at least three things that we encounter and experience on this side of eternity that we will not have to endure on that side of eternity. And I've got to admit to you today that I am excited about these three truths. Look with me. First of all, this morning in verse 4, we're reminded that in heaven there will be no more sorrow and no more suffering. I remember uh, back when I was a student in Bible college, I had a job with the United Postal Service. I had a highway contract uh, route. I'd begin about 6 in the morning. I'd get done somewhere about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Enough time for me to catch one of the mid-morning classes here at Clear Creek as, uh, as a commuter. But I remember going in one day to the office about 5, 30, 6 a.m. And I went into the back room of the, of the, uh, the Barberville Post Office where the mail is processed. And, and all of a sudden when I walked through those swinging double doors, I heard a female voice that said, hey, hey you, you're a preacher, right? And I could tell by the tone I didn't want to be at that moment. <laughs> I could tell she was mad at God and she was about to take it out on me and she came over there wagging her bony finger in my face and she said, if there is a God, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people, especially to children. Here I am nearly 20 years later, and that's still the number one question that I get asked on a regular basis. But you know what occurs to me? People don't really want to know why we suffer. 
But people want to know, is there a way to stop the sorrow? Is there a way to stop the suffering that I encounter in my life? And the short answer to that is no. If it were possible to have suspended sorrow and, and suffering, then the apostle Peter here in this epistle and in his second epistle, he would have told his readers how because his, his audience was suffering. Some of their loved ones, their heads had been severed from their bodies and were being used as human torches to light the city streets at night. Some of them, they used them to play tug of war and, and they would gamble and, 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 and wage as to which part of the body would be, uh, would be larger when they tied two ropes to two horses and, and began to tug at the corpse of that individual. Would it be the upper torso or the lower extremities? Uh, that would be greater. Many of them had been jailed. Some of them had lost their jobs and their property property and possessions. But we notice today that when Peter seeks to speak hope and encouragement into their life, he didn't tell them how that they could stop the suffering or the sorrow, but he did point them to hope, and that is the hope of heaven. And he intended for that hope to bring encouragement to their heart. We notice in verse 4 the word imperishable. And as I understand, this word means that it's not prone to decay or to destruction. It's undecaying in essence or continuance. Now, on this side of eternity, we are acquainted with the effects of war and natural disasters. Coming out of this weekend, our social media feeds, our, our news feeds, the news cycles have, have showed images. I made the mistake yesterday of, of watching some scenes that were produced or, or shown through the Daily Wire, and it showed the literal beheading of Israeli soldiers who had fell slain at the hands of Hamas. And it's heartbreaking on this side of eternity to see the devastation of war, to see crumbled buildings, to see the destructive property. We think about the battle in Ukraine and Russia that we've been watching for more than a year now, and we've seen the devastation there. We think about our neighbors in West Kentucky that were ravaged uh, by a massive tornado, and our neighbors in East Kentucky uh, whose homes and livelihoods were destroyed by the massive floods that swept through the mountains of East Kentucky. And might I mention that we are still feeling the effects of the pandemic medically, socially, politically, even economically. Experiences like these should make us appreciate the reality of our heavenly inheritance all the more. That word imperishable, as I understand it, was used in the secular Greek to describe something that was unravaged by an invading army like a city or like a home. How many knows that we have an enemy? And the Bible describes our enemy as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, as a thief that comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. It's because of Satan we suffer. It's because of Satan that we endure sorrow on this side of eternity. We see that in the trials of Job. A man that the Bible describes as a perfect man, full of integrity, one who feared God and turned away from evil. But yet the Bible promises you and I a day when there will be no sorrow, a day when there will be no suffering, a day when there will no longer be sadness. Think about it with me for just a moment. We're looking forward to a day, my brothers and sisters in Christ, when there will be no more cancer, no more car wrecks, and no more cardiac arrest. A day without diabetes, dementia, or diverticulitis. A day without liver failure, loss of sight, or the need for life support. We're talking about a day in the future where there'll be no strokes, strep throat, or even stomach bugs. Paralysis Paralysis, Parkinson's pains, and pandemics will all be gone. There will no longer be any danger. No doctors, nor will there be any diagnosis. John described that day 
in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and verse 3 and 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will no longer exist because the previous things have passed away. I don't know what you're enduring, but I know we've had some of our family here at Clear Creek to endure some heavy loads in these last few months. But I'm telling you, if you'll just hang on, there's something better that awaits us. I, I remember a few uh, years ago, my wife and I were shopping for some clothes for our children, and, and there was a T-shirt that caught my attention. It said glory in big letters across the chest of that shirt. And underneath it, it defined glory as this, what awaits me at the finish line. Now, that shirt was talking about athletics. It was talking about the splendor of being recognized for achievement. But I've got news for them. There's a glory that awaits the child of God. It's what awaits us at the finish line. And in heaven, there will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more suffering. Well, let me show you the second one. Thinking about verse 4, we're also told that in heaven, there will be no more sin. I've got a couple of thoughts about this one. Do you realize that we live in a world that is now plagued by sin, but it hasn't always been this way? I mean, think about it. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God stepped back and looked at the creation that he had made, and God said, it is good. Everything God does is good until man messes it up. It is good. That's because God had created a world without sin. Now, you and I know the answer. You're theologians, scholars, students of the Bible. You've at least read the first five chapters of the book of Genesis. But most of the people in our pew have not. And they struggle with this. If God made a world that was good in Genesis chapter 1, then preacher do tell what went wrong. Well, we know he placed the man Adam and the woman Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he assigned to them the responsibility of protecting and preserving the earth's goodness. You remember the warning that he gave Adam and Eve? One command. One command. That's all they had. One command. He told them in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, you are free to eat from every tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. What did God mean? You shall surely die. I think there's a couple of things there. I think he meant that you will ruin and corrupt the earth's goodness and its innocence. That in that moment you will open Pandora's box and, and all of a sudden sorrow and suffering and sin will come flooding in and it'll be impossible for you to, to shut that box. I, I believe he meant that you will introduce the world to evil and open the door of disappointment and despair. And certainly we have seen the effects of that. We see it every day in the headlines when someone is murdered. We see it every day when we learn about those who have experienced the tragedy that we call uh, divorce and the dysfunctional homes that, that are plaguing our society. We see it every day with the addicts that are bound up in the bondage of drug addiction. We see the, 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 the wake that's left behind sinful decisions and choices as those who stand behind sacred pulpits like this, our spiritual leaders within our Christian faith, they fall because of moral failure. We, we see the devastation and the consequences of living in a world of sin. We live in a world of, that is plagued by sin, but I'm thankful I can tell you it will not always be this way. To borrow from the words 
of the hymn writer who wrote, we, we read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's word he has written. How beautiful heaven must be. In heaven, no drooping or pining, no wishing for elsewhere to be. God's light is forever there shining. How beautiful heaven must be. Pure waters of life there are flowing, and all who will drink may be free. Rare jewels of splendor are glowing. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. Fair haven of anybody in the house weary. Fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. Peter speaks of that here in the middle of this verse when he uses the word uncorrupted. As I understand it, that word means free from contamination. Unsoiled. Unstained. Well, what does it mean that in heaven our inheritance will be imperishable? There'll be no sorrow, no suffering. What does it mean that our inheritance will be uncorrupted? I'll tell you what it means. It means there's coming a day. Boy, you better buckle, buckle your seatbelt. There, there's coming a day when Satan will be bound and sin will forever cease. Boy, I love that picture we get at the end of the book of Revelation. And regardless of what your eschatological view is, there's one thing we can agree on. Jesus is coming again, and at the end, he triumphs over the enemy. He will put him in his place. And when Jesus comes back, though the Antichrist have gathered all the armies of the world together to make war against our Savior, all Jesus will have to do is open his mouth and they'll fall before him as dead. And Satan will hand himself over and he will be bound into the pit. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, the, de the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are and they will, I like this, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. They've done enough tormenting. It's time they get their due. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 and 8 speaks of you and I. You see, today we're not victims, but we're victors. In Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says the victor will inherit these things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowards and unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. I think about Jesus in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20. His disciples were amazed because demon spirits had responded to them. Jesus said, that's no big deal. I saw Satan fall like lightning. If you're going to rejoice, I'll tell you something to rejoice about. Rejoice because your name has been written in the book of life. Because your name has been written in heaven. In heaven because there'll be no more sin. There'll be no condemnation. There'll be no temptation, and there'll be no reputations. Amen. In heaven, there'll be no sorrow, no suffering, no sin. I got one more. In heaven, there'll be no more separation, no death. Now, here on earth, some of you may be familiar with the old country song. The old country song said, time is marching on. Well, I've got news for you. Time's not marching on. Time's running out. Time is running out. We call this dilemma the brevity of life. And the Bible has a lot to say about the brevity of life. The book of Job, chapter 7, and verse 6, Job said, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and they come to an end without hope. Job chapter 9 and verse 25, now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away and they see no good. We're most familiar with James chapter 4 and verse 14. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor. 
You're here today, and you're gone tomorrow. Uh, boy, Dr. Nix, I believe that's true. I just celebrated this past spring in May, celebrated with my fellow classmates 20 years of a high school reunion. And for some of you say, that's just a drop in the bucket because you're well beyond that, and I get that. But I remember when I was a teenager, I couldn't wait to get my driver's license. I wanted my, my wings. Couldn't wait to turn 18. I wanted to be a legal eagle, right? I wanted that liberty, that, that freedom. And now I'd just like to be young again. <laughs> I'd like to wake up. Yesterday I woke up and my knees were hurting so bad. I didn't want to walk. Help me, Jesus, right? You know what I'm talking about. Time's not marching on. It's running out. Every time a loved one passes, we, we feel the sting of death. Now, I know, I, I know. You don't have to preach at me. We do not grieve as those who have no hope. We have hope. His name is Jesus. I preached 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at many of a funeral and a graveside. I, I understand there's hope and comfort in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I know there's hope and comfort in the promise of his second coming. I, I, I know about the hope, and, but, but we still feel the sting of death. I preached my grandfather's funeral several years ago. He was my best friend. It hurt when he died. Brother Taylor just preached a funeral for his father it hurt. He's still hurting. Even though we know where our loved ones have gone, it still hurts. We feel the sting of death. Yet the Bible promises the child of God a home in heaven where there will be no more suffering, no more sin, and no more separation. You see, that's where the word unfading comes in. Unfading and kept in heaven for you, right there at the end of verse 4. As I understand it, this word speaks of duration. Duration. Now think about this for a moment. This word, as I understand it in its secular use, is an agricultural or a horticultural word. I don't have much of a, a green thumb but back during COVID, my wife and I, we built a house some years ago. And as I was telling our class this morning at MT3, I, I am a, a little bit of a financial conservative person. Uh, some might argue that I'm tight, um, but I don't like to spend money. And I, I kept putting off the landscaping and I, I just didn't want to waste that money. Plus, it was the time that, that it would take to put all that together. But then this thing called COVID hit. And we had nothing but time. And my wife wanted to make good use of my time. And so we found a local nursery that sold some shrubs and bushes and plants and flowers and uh, landscaping rock. That stuff's straight from hell. <laughs> and so here we are. So we spend a week toiling and laboring over those things. But I got educated in some horticulture. For example, there are two types of plants that you can plant in your landscaping. And some of you know this better than I do. There are annuals. An annual plant is a plant that completes its life cycle within one growing season, and then it dies. Lack of vapor, it's there, and then it's gone. But then there are perennials. And perennials have a lasting or they exist for a long or apparently infinite time, enduring or continually recurring. And, and that's low maintenance. That's what I need. I need something I can plant this year that will come back on its own next year so that I don't have to spend money or waste time on it. Can I get an amen? amen. Perennials. So you plant them and they just keep coming back time and time again. You know what occurs to me? What Peter is drawing a contrast here between unbelievers and believers. Unfading. The inheritance that we have in heaven is unfading, without end, complete in its duration. Unbelievers are like annuals. They bloom on this side of eternity for a season, but then they wither and they fade away and they're no more. But the child of God is like a perennial. They bloom here, but they blossom throughout eternity. Unending, without end. 
Hallelujah. Makes me want to get saved all over again. To God be the glory. To know that we have a heavenly home. No matter how heavy the load may get here on this side of eternity, no matter how great the burdens may be, no matter how disappointed or depressed that we may come, just lift your head and look up to the hope of the heavenly inheritance that Christ has reserved for you. There's no sorrow, no suffering. There's no sin. And there is no separation. Some call it heaven, I call it home, some call it dreaming, let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies, some call it heaven. We call it home. God bless you.